And now, filling in for Joanne Shaw, Julia Makos. Welcome to Down the Garden Path, where we discuss down-to-earth tips and advice while doing our best to help you seasonally manage your garden and landscape. I'm the gardening girl, Julia DeMacos, and with me is my co-host, Matthew Dressing. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Matthew Dressing, owner of Natural Affinity Garden Design. As landscape designers and gardeners, we believe it's important and possible to have great gardens, which are sustainable and low maintenance, and we want to help you make it happen. So welcome, Julia. Yes, Joanne is away, everybody. She is off in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean on a wonderful cruise, uh, enjoying some time off. So I am here with returning guest superstar, Julia Demacos, uh, the gardening girl. And uh, yeah, we are going to have a wonderful show for you tonight. Uh, when you think of tea, we're going to talk all about tea. When you think of tea, one of the last places you might think you could grow tea and make your own tea is in Canada or maybe even the northern United States. Tonight, as we kick off Authors Month on Down the Garden Path, my co-host and Down the Garden Path serial guest superstar, as I said, uh, Julia Demacos, is here to talk all about her new book, Tea Gardening for Beginners. We'll learn about how easy it is for you to grow, harvest, and prepare your own tea at home to create that perfect cup to enjoy. So if you have a question for Julia about her amazing vegetable gardens, her new tea uh, book, Tea Gardening for Beginners, uh, or any of her online resources, uh, definitely send us a question. We'd love to hear from you down the garden path podcast at hotmail.com. So yeah, welcome to the show, Julia. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be back and to co-host with you today. <laughs> this is yeah, so much fun. It is. It's so fun that you can <laughs> fill in with me for Joanne. So yeah, I thought it would be great. We could uh, kick off the month talking about your amazing, beautiful new book, um, all about tea gardening for, or tea gardening for beginners. I know I'm a big uh, tea gardener and we love checking in with you uh, and your massive vegetable garden in uh, Mono, Ontario. So yeah, definitely. So we're, I'm looking forward to that as well. Just in case anybody, if you're new to the show, uh, maybe you haven't heard one of our past episodes with uh, Julia on before. Let me tell you a little bit about Julia and uh, then we will get into everything. So Julia started growing food after having children and fell in love with it. She gardens organically and tries to keep things simple while growing new and uncommon vegetables each year. Her garden is located in Mono, Ontario on 25 acres on the Niagara Escarpment. Uh, two years ago, Julia expanded her vegetable garden from 2,000 to 7,000 square feet, continuing in the formal kitchen garden style. Julie has been growing vegetables and writing about organic, uh, sorry, writing about gardening for over 10 years, um, has been twice published in the Canadian Organic Grower magazine, and has just released, uh, or has recently released her new ebook, How to Plan a Vegetable Garden. So there's some great uh, resources out there from Julia. Julia loves to inspire others to have their own vegetable gardens by showing them the simpler side of gardening. She enjoys teaching others, speaking, and holding workshops. So yeah, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you so again. much for having me. <laughs> I'm so excited that <laughs> Thanks you're here. again. <laughs> Actually, now it's been three years since we did the garden. It's been three <gasps> years since uh, that was from our first uh, interview from a couple of years ago, I think. <gasps> that's but, right. I, <laughs> I, that's what I have to update my notes. <laughs> yeah, and, and going into 12 years of growing food now, it's going to be, it's the 12th year. It's crazy how time wow. flies. Yes. Oh, time flies. <laughs> it's amazing. That's crazy. It is amazing. <laughs> it yeah. is amazing. Um, so yeah, so how did the summer just flew by, it feels like? How was your summer in the garden? Um, you know, what did it grow? What challenges? How was the year? 
So it was really great. It was really, really busy this year. I decided to grow more tomatoes than last year. Last year I had over 70 plants and, you know, I was too excited this year and I uh, stopped at 90 this year. So I had 90 tomato plants in the garden, all from seed. And it was really even, it was hard to cut to 90. Like I had way more I had extra <laughs> seedlings, I had over a hundred, I don't know, maybe 110 seedlings, but I had to pick the 90 and I planted them and they did really well and um, produced a ton of tomatoes to the point where like, I'm done with tomatoes. <laughs> so it was really fun. It was really interesting. I grew a lot of really cool new varieties, um, things I'm going to have, varieties I'll have in my seed shop later this um, fall uh, for next year's seeds, uh, many new varieties that I've never grown before, some really exciting ones, and uh, lots of uh, cherry tomatoes. It was really abundant. And then, of course, good old late blight came around, and that Aww. happened again. <laughs> happened again. So 90 plants of late blight. I mean, they didn't all succumb badly, some worse than others. I find the heirloom beef steaks succumb probably before many of the others, many of the cherry mm. tomatoes didn't. Like even the Matswell cherry, even though there was blight on the plant, there, the tomatoes were actually blight free. Many others like the Brad's Atomic Grape and the Blush didn't really have blight on the fruit until much later. So I was able to continue growing even though there was blight. And because I didn't clean up the garden as soon as I saw the blight and we had kind of like a cool down and the heat, like a warm up again, they started growing again. So they kept producing fruit even though the plants looked like they had damage. So some were like succumbed immediately and I cut them out and the others are kind of just based on how they were growing. So anyways, that happened. I decided not to grow any cucurbits this year. So no zucchini, no squash, no pumpkins, no cucumbers, nothing because yeah. Did I yeah, mention no, that I before say, too? Cause... No, you didn't, but I was just wondering what, why didn't you do that? So I didn't because the last two years and so starting from two years ago in 2020, it was the first time I ever had cucumber beetles, squash bugs, squash my borders, mores. I've never had, had never had them in all those years of growing food. That was the first experience. And so it was a real challenge staying on top of them. And I did everything I could, a lot of hand picking them, but a lot of, you know, anxiety. So then last year I tried again, sure enough, they were out. I planted the, the plants even earlier than like the last frost, I covered them and they were out the next day. So the previous year they emerged in July, this year, last year they emerged May. So, you know, that was extremely frustrating. So I didn't want to have the stress of having to battle with them for a third yeah. year. So I thought I'm just going to cut them out of my garden. And when they emerge, if they emerge, if they overwintered, there'll be nothing to eat that can leave or die. So I didn't have any and it was fine. I'm hoping to go to try again next year. Maybe not a lot to start, but just to see if I put a few plants in, are they going to come back immediately or will I be able to grow successfully? So that's, that was different. Um, really successful with beets and carrots this year. Uh, the beets, I multi sowed them indoors first into little seedling um, cell packs of three, four seeds per cell and then let them grow as little bundles. So I had 72 cells of three, four beets seedlings per cell. So imagine whatever oh. 72 times three or four is, that's how many beets I grew. <laughs> wow. Hundreds? <laughs> and um, they're still in the garden. I've been harvesting them and I haven't, been really good at like harvesting and consuming and leaving the rest. And so now I'm on top of them. I don't have any just sitting around rotting in the house. They're in the garden. So because the season's been so long this year, we've actually had it. It was great because I was able to extend the season without protection and carrots abundant this year. So, you know, I learned some, some, some things about it. I'm sure I'm going to do posts on explaining what I think is uh, helpful in growing carrots successfully. I had really great success this year, really big straight carrots and uh, yeah, so those are my successes for sure. And then what else you asked me? You asked me what was new. So what was new was I have been growing plants for tea for many years. And then this year I was really excited. So I added way more uh, plants for tea and uh, they did really well. So I have, well, I did la- lemongrass last year, but a ton of lemongrass. I did um chamomile amazing chamomile this year lots of mints um marshmallow tulsi basil which i adore I, it's one of my favorite things Ooh. yeah <laughs> and I've that's never in the heard book. That one. yeah so tulsi basil is a basil and also known as holy basil and it's oh, not okay, a basilicum yeah. it's not a basilicum it's like a different type of basil and it is um some i mean i think they're i guess they're like a 
maybe an Indian type of basil or Mediterranean. I'm not sure, but from the other end of the world. And they have a really uh, beautiful, sweet smell to them. So I don't cook with them. I only grow them for tea and they're amazing. And they fill the, like the space in the garden. It smells so sweet and I can't even explain it. Like if flavors, if you're, if you add a Tulsi basil to your tea blend mix, it just makes the flavor incredible. So that, and plus the plant is so abundant. You, you grow it for the flowers and the leaves, but then you can cut it back halfway um, midsummer and it'll regrow and flower again. So, you know, you can stay on top of it and you can have a, a second flush. So lots of Tulsi basil. Uh, and I also grew lots of, oh yeah, lemon verbena this year. Lots mm -hmm. of lemon verbena. I have a huge jar saved of, le of leaves and, and also uh, chamomile, like I mentioned before, mint, just so much catnip. There's just so many fun things you can grow. So that was really successful for me. All the herbs for tea and flowers too. And all the flowers too. Well, okay. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned you have all these beautiful herbs and plants um, for tea gardening. So let's go towards the book. Well, tea gardening. So what is it? Is it just growing plants and leaves? And like, so what's, how do we do that? What is tea garden? So, okay. So tea <laughs> traditionally, so we know tea as like black tea, then there's also green tea and there's white tea and there's oolong tea. Right. So there's all these different teas. So most people don't know that one plant, the Camellia sinensis plant, the tea bush that grows and produces all those teas. So that's in the book and I discuss how to grow it. And now here where we live in the Northern hemisphere, like this, these, the Camellia sinensis grows really successfully in China and in India where mm -hmm. the conditions are warmer, more humid. It really likes those kinds of conditions. So if you're in the South, maybe if you're in California, you can grow it. And, but here it doesn't really, it doesn't overwinter. So you can grow it as a house plant. It, it is not as abundant as it would be if it was a perennial growing in the ground. So for fun, you can grow some. But the thing is, the Camellia sinensis plant, based on when you harvest or what point in the season and which part you harvest, like the top two leaves, maybe it's the three, depending on when in the season, that and how it's processed, like how it's dried, et cetera, and processed oxidation and all that occurs, that creates the tea that's either white, green, oolong, or black tea. They all come from the same plant based on when you harvest them. Oh, see, that's neat. That I didn't know. I knew that it was the tea plant, but I didn't realize how they got the, the different teas from the different parts of just where the harvest is. Yeah. When you harvest. Very cool. Okay. So the white tea is harvested in the spring, and it's the first two leaves that emerge at the tip of the stem, and they haven't unfurled yet. And they're kind of, they're, it's called white tea because like before they're open, the leaves, they look like they're white and kind of soft and fluffy. So you'd harvest those and you wouldn't let them oxidize. So when you, they oxidize, they turn brown. So you would like it, the process, which is discussed in the book of how to properly process them um, is a way that they're hardly handled. And then they don't go through the oxidation, oxidation process. They don't turn brown like a black tea leaf. And then you have white tea, which is really delicate tea. And then green tea is like the next one to be harvested later in the season. And that is also like the top two leaves, but they're opened. And then those okay. also, you don't want them to oxidize because they'll turn brown and they'll change. Then oolong tea is the next tea that you would harvest in the season, same plant. But then you would take like the next two leaves or so. And then there's a process of processing it, which has some oxidation. And then black tea is the one that is later in the season. It's the lower part of the stem or of the branch. And then that would be processed the most. And you'd want, you'd want to roll it and handle it. And that would make it oxidize, which would make it like an apple. When you cut it open, it turns brown or potato. That's the same thing. That's oxidation. And so that would, um, then that would dry, like brown it, and then the flavors would emerge, and then you would dry it properly, and then you'd have black tea. So they're all from the same plant, from the same branch, basically. <laughs> and that's, that's all the teas of the Camellia sinensis plant. Oh, so that's, wow. So that's tea. That's proper tea. So if you, you know, if you're using the term correctly, tea means anything from the Camellia sinensis plant. But the, all the other things that we can grow here where we live in the, you know, in the north and, you know, anywhere really in the world, those are tisanes. So tisanes are not tea leaves with caffeine in them. They are caffeine free and they are anything. So in the book, I talk about leaves, flowers. I talk about roots. I talk about fruit. I talk about seeds. And these are all the other things that you can use for tea and make tea blends. They're herbal. Um, often they're medicinal. And they are caffeine free. So that's 
but you can grow here. All these things are very easy to grow. And then you can grow some as house plants too. So like I have an orange plant and I take it outside in the summer, then I bring it inside in the winter, it makes a fruit every year. You know, the leaves can be used, the fruit is yummy, you can keep the rind. So, you know, it's just, I'm not going to grow up, you know, a orchard of it, but it's no. fun to, if you want to grow your own and you're growing organically, <laughs> um, then you can, you know, have a little dabble of it and experience what it would be like. Wow. So, so yeah. there's really some great flexibility to create all these teas in normal or northern climates or anywhere in the world, really, you yeah. just have to grow the plants that you yeah. want to make the tea out of. So really nothing crazy special like around uh, the Camellia chinensis, but it's, uh, or Sinensis, sorry. Um, Sinensis, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so you could just grow them indoors or your normal. You can grow pots, them so indoors. Could... So like uh, in the book, I talk about different garden ideas. So there's definitely a lot in there about if you don't have a, like a garden, you can grow in a pot. I talk about growing in a pot. I talk about growing in a container or in a raised bed. I talk about in the ground. So I give different options. But if you don't have a garden and all you have is a balcony, then there's no reason why you can't grow, you know, herbs in pots. And if you don't have a balcony, you can still grow on the windowsill, you know, and then there's like, there's so many grow lights available on the market. Yeah. You can even buy lamps, you know, it doesn't even have to be a full on rack of lights. It could just be like a lamp that is sold on Amazon as easy as that or online somewhere. And it's, that can be enough to provide enough light to grow. So if I lived in an apartment with no balcony, all I had was a window, I would still grow mint. I would still grow Tulsi basil easily. There's many other basils that are not in the book. Like we had to cut down. We were going to have way more herbs in there, but we had to cut down because there's too many. Uh, but there's basils, like cinnamon basil I grew last year. And that smells oh. like cinnamon. You could easily do cinnamon basil. You could do sacred blue basil. Like there's so many other, you know, uh, even Thai basil. And then there's like herbs. You could sage makes a lovely tea. Thyme makes a lovely tea. Like you can oh. use culinary herbs and add them into tea blends to get different kinds of flavors. And if I really would have kept going, I could have put like pine needles, you know, spruce mm. is really nice. It's resinous. It's really delicious. I, I harvest, uh, which is not in the book, but I harvest spruce tips and pine, um, I guess, like the baby, the little baby growth. So oh, like as long candles. as you don't like, yeah, that's right. So you can make tea out of those. So every spring, uh, we have lots of spruce trees on our property. I harvest spruce tips. Now, as long as you don't like strip a whole side, which would be really difficult anyway, but you take some here, some there, some all around. Those are amazing. So I dry them. They're really high in vitamin C. They have a real lemony flavor to them. They're amazing. And I add them to my tea blends and they really add that, you know, that nice tart kind of flavor without, you know, putting lemon. They have a lemony flavor. And you can do other, you can get crazy with them. You can get, you know, experiment, cook with them. I make syrups out of them for cocktails I even make syrups like in the winter if I need to have like a simple syrup for a cocktail I just go outside I know this is <laughs> off topic but this is you can no, make tea the same way pick some needles pick some and boil them and make a tea and it's really great and it's delicious and it's really healthy and there's just so many options wow so there's just so many plants that we just have all around us probably without even thinking about it we could be making teas trees the shrubs yeah. the herbs everything yeah and, go ahead so I was going to say that, you know, I, I, because of where I live and I know where I'm harvesting, but if you go foraging and you know, um, if you're foraging in a place which is not sprayed, so there's no chemicals, you know, you can harvest so many things foraged. So I harvest dandelion flowers here on our property. We don't spray and I, they're amazing. If I they love smell like honey. And everything. They're yes. so great, right? You can yeah. actually, um, and the root is, I think it's in my book, uh, unless we cut it out, but chicory, right? Chicory comes from. Uh, the dandelion plant or a chicory plant of some kind there it's in my book chicory page 100 and so that is chicory is like radicchio it's endive dandelion they're all the same family but the root can be harvested now like in the fall and you can dry it cut it up dry it and that you can grind it up and make an alternative to the coffee yeah you can put it in your tea or you can like powder it and put it in your tea also uh, and so add that chicory flavor oh there's so you, much so, yeah so you can you can like forage for the stuff i harvest i foraged we grow we have a ginkgo tree on our property so i harvest the leaves and you harvest them before they fall so just as they start changing color there's so many great medicinal benefits to it plus like brain health and all that so i harvested two giant jars of that dried it and i'm gonna have 
I'm going to add ginkgo. And then hawthorn berries are in season right now. You can go oh, yeah. and harvest them. Um, and you can take some of those and they're really great for many other medicinal reasons. So I dried those and I have those, I put them in my tea blend. So you can read red clover. <laughs> I mean, like the, red clover the is list book, is just, <laughs> it's just once you start, right? Like you can, you can read this and you can get really excited. And then you can think like, what else can I do? And then you can like find new herbs that you've never tried and really get creative with your blends and take them into all kinds of directions, whether it's like for flavor, or if you just enjoy the taste, or if you want to have some medicinal benefit to it too, like you can just, the sky is a limit. <laughs> so, okay. So many questions are proceeding <laughs> in my mind. So you were talking about the leaves and preparing the leaves. Um, you gathered the ginkgo leaves, you've dried them. Do we have to do are we doing the same thing to like the flowers, the fruits, the seeds, and the roots? We're giving them a time to like cure, um, okay. dry out a little bit, and then use them? Or is it a little bit so of both? Yes. Yeah, so in my book, I talk about how to process all of them. So every, every uh, plant that's listed in my book, I tell you how exactly to process it, how to preserve it, how to keep it. And so everything is different. So if the plant material is thin and delicate, then you would dry it. You can either hang it to dry, like put it in bundles or lay it out on racks. But I like my dehydrator because I just like how it, you know, I find that the plant's material kind of maintains the same kind of look, doesn't really change colors. It doesn't, it doesn't get dusty. I just, I, I like my dehydrator. Sometimes I do hang things. Sometimes I lay things out. So like calendula flowers, I like to lay them out and the bugs can crawl out by themselves. And then, you know, they dry at their own pace and then it's easy. So if you don't have a dehydrator, you could still dry them, but air dry, but it will take a long time if the plant material is thicker. So smaller, uh, thinner leaves, flowers are more delicate. They, you would dehydrate them at a low temperature. In the book, I think I have like 100 or 115. You could even do 95. And then you can set the temperature and you can monitor them. They might take 12 hours to dry. Maybe they'll take 24, depending on how much moisture is in the plant material. Roots are a lot heavier and thicker. So right. they take more time to dry depending on if there's any moisture in the roots. Uh, so that will take more time if there's moisture. And so that one you would set at a higher temperature and maybe monitor it, give it 10 hours, give it six, give it eight, 12, whatever it is, just check on it. Um, I have three different dehydrators in my house because I <laughs> use it all the time. And so I wanted to get one of those that, um, you know, like not an Excalibur, but it's similar to Excalibur. It's a door, there's racks and there's trays and then you can, it sets the timer. So I, it's good and it's bad. So, you know, my other ones, my, I have um, two others. I forgot the name. This just slipped my mind right now. But they are great because I just turn it on, leave it, come back later. Whereas the new one, it has a timer. So then I forget. Oh, yeah, I have that thing drying. I go, oh, oh it needs another yeah. six hours or 10. I don't know. <laughs> so, you know, you have to be more on top of it. And I kind of keep it away from, I keep it in my gardening room. So it's it's on the, it's on the shelf, but I tend to forget. So it depends on which one you're using but the dehydrator is great so but if you're doing fruit fruit is really wet right there's a lot of moisture in it so that will take yeah. longer to dry and a higher temperature so maybe to like 150 and then said 140 to 150 turn it on leave it it needs more time and the higher temperature will help to uh to dry it uh you don't want to set leaves at 150 because you will scorch them they don't need that right okay mm -hmm. and do you find that um, maybe like air drying versus the dehydrator? Do you find that one holds the flavor better than the other? Or do you find that maybe the dehydrator is just better for thinner stuff? And like, I could definitely see the, the aesthetics of the dehydrator, especially for the thinner stuff, keeping its uh, color and its... Um, yeah, it, it definitely doesn't looking. fade. It doesn't fade. If you're using a dehydrator, I find things don't fade. And air drying is fine too, and uh, but it can take a long time. And the thing about it is if it, there's moisture in the plant material that you're trying to dry and you leave it to air dry, it can mold. Right, so yes. putting it in a dehydrator does prevent things from molding because they're not sitting in a, you know air room temperature environment. They're kind of hot. So then it kills any bacteria as it dries it. So it depends, like tell sea basil, I don't put it in a dehydrator. I don't need to, it dries really quickly. So I just lay it out and then it just, it dries and I can feel it. it, doesn't take long. And then that's how I dry that. Plus it's so bulky. So things that are bulky because it's stems and flowers and it's all really big, 
I'd have to cut it down really small to put it into my dehydrator, close the lid, put all the trays one on top of the other. So mm-hmm. it's a lot easier to air dry. And that one you can also tie. Uh, I, I harvested, I grow marshmallow um, in my garden. So marshmallow root, it would make marshmallow, you could powder it, make marshmallows. But I grow it for the, uh, I harvest the leaves and the flowers and I make tea with that. It's really nice um, addition to the to tea blend is mild, but it's it's nice. It adds some flavor. But I tie those up and I hang them to dry because they're also bulky and big and they dry perfectly fine hanging up and they're still hanging. Actually, I need to probably take them apart and put them into a jar at this point. But (laughs) but so so it depends on what it is. Uh, You know, if you're going to be cutting it up, I think it's easier to put in the dehydrate. If it's big and bulky, like technically sage, you could you could hang up and dry it that way or you could put in the dehydrate. Rosemary, the same thing. Any of these like branchy things. Um, catnip, all these things I like to dry, depending on how bulky it is, either air dry or if I can get into the dehydrator, I do that. Very cool. So there's so many different options and so many fun so things many. you could be doing yeah. um, to create these amazing teas um, using the roots, the leaves, the flowers. Awesome. How long do, if you create the teas, you've dried out your roots, your flowers, how long do they normally last? Do they have a long shelf like loaf? life like normal tea (laughs) or it depends it depends on where you store them so my the ideal place to store I like glass jars so glass jars are my favorite they also don't um there's no uh nothing leaches off of them right they're in a glass jar it's sterile you close the lid it's airtight so I really like that if you put it in a bag you know it's plastic you might leach some plastic but also it's not really airtight it'll still something will get through so in a glass jar away from direct sunlight like I like a cupboard you know if you have a cupboard or a drawer or a shelf somewhere with away from light it'll easily last for at least 12 months so what you do then if it's been longer than 12 months you open the jar and you smell it and if it has zero smell it's done you just compost it if it still smells good then it's good so it could last up to two years depending on the situation if it's warm and where you're keeping it it might you know basically air out much quicker if it's just like a cool dry dark place it'll last longer so that really helps plus another thing is and it's not in the book um you if you keep if you harvest a lot and you have a lot of plant material you're better off crunching as much as you need as opposed to crunching it all down powdering it and then that'll if you do and you break up the plant material to small bits that will evaporate the smell will you know, all the flavors and the aromas will evaporate. So you're better off keeping it whole and only processing what you need and at a time, and then it'll be stay fresher for longer. Cool. That's a good tip. That's a good tip. I would have just crushed it all down and thought I just need to make my blend and put it in the, in the cupboard and left it. You're almost better off not making like the entire thing as a blend. You're almost better off just making portions. So I make blends in jars and in the book and the recipes, I also explain that they're like, I, I give a larger portion than you would take portions of that to make your tea. So you measure into a jar and then you mix it all up. So in parts based on, you know, what, how much of each you need in your, in your blend. And, um, and then you would make that and that'll be what you'd use. And then when you're complete, almost close to being finished that jar, then you might as well make another blend or the same blend and write down your blend, like put on the label. Uh, I even use sticky notes and just tape the sticky note to the jar, but so I know exactly how much I put, like, because I do parts, but then you choose what your measuring cup will be, whether it's going to be like a part of a, is your part a tablespoon? So you're doing three tablespoons to one to one. Are you doing half cup measurements? So I write exactly how much of each. So then when I'm done that blend, I can recreate the exact same blend because I've written down the exact measurement of each ingredient. And I can just like copy that, stir it up, put it back in the yeah. jar. Yeah. Very cool. So we're going to talk about more about blends and creating recipes and uh, dive a bit more into the book. I'm going to jump in and say thank you, everybody, for joining us here on Reality Radio 101. I'm Matthew Dressing here with my co-host, the gardening girl, Julia DeMacos. And you were listening to Down the Garden Path. Uh, Julia and I, and normally Joanne, but she's not here, uh, enjoy hosting Down the Garden Path each week bringing you interesting and relevant topics to help you achieve a great garden. We learn right along with you from our research and from the guests like Julia who join us on the show. 
If you're just tuning in, we are talking with Julia all about her new book, Tea Gardening for Beginnings for Beginners. And we are learning all about making and growing our own teas. So stay tuned. We're going to jump into some great flavorful recipes. Don't forget you can spend more time with us down the garden path. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Down the Garden Path Podcast is our handle there. And you can find lots of past content on all of your favorite podcast providers. Um, For example, we had a show with Julia uh, earlier this year talking all about growing herbs. Um, So we can definitely check out that episode for growing your own herbs and growing these plants for teas. Uh, And don't forget while you're there, hit that subscribe button to be notified of new content. And please don't forget to like, share and leave a comment. We love hearing from our listeners. You can always write us when we're off the air down the garden path podcast at hotmail.com. You can reach us anytime during the week. And don't forget to check out our websites. You can find uh, Julia at juliademacos.com. And you can find myself at www.naturalaffinity.ca. So we've talked about growing crazy amounts of beautiful herbs, basils, all sorts of flavorful plants that maybe we wouldn't normally be growing. Um, We've talked about, you know, creating a little bit of a blend, but let's build on that. Your book has some beautiful, delicious recipes. Like, so if you were going to start by creating a blend, I think the book is a great starting point. You've got some delicious recipes that I'm going to have to grow and try myself. Um, I'm so excited to do, but what would you have some tips? Like, should we just throw flavors together? Are there some culinary rules that kind of play true or blend over into creating our tea blends? Where do we start with that? So I have a page in my book where I talk about this and I don't remember which page it was on, but I talk about how to, here we go. I think this is it. Uh, So page 11, I don't know if you have the book there, but Mm -hmm. it's crafting mindful blends. And so on that page, I discuss, you know, you've got a base ingredient. So the base ingredient will have a strong flavor. And so that will make up the bulk of your uh, tea blend. So the base ingredient could be mint. It could be chamomile. It could be Tulsi basil. It could be, you know, that would be like a good blend, something with a nice flavor. It could be ginger. That could be a base ingredient as well. So that's that would be your largest one. And so it, you, as, as I mentioned before, when you're measuring in parts, so you want to choose your part. So maybe that would be like if you're making a larger jar. Maybe you want to use a cup or half a cup measure. So you could do, you know, if you want to start small, do like a cup of the mint or two cups of mint. That'll be two parts of that ingredient. And then you want to have the next ingredient. It could be a secondary ingredient. So the secondary ingredient, these would help to round out the blend. So you can add lemon balm, for example, as your secondary ingredient. And so those ingredients aren't as strong flavored. Uh, They do need that base ingredient in order to bring out flavor, but they do help round and add some flavor. So, you know, you can, I think lemongrass is a pretty good base. That could be like a base ingredient, or you can add lemongrass if you're trying to bring out flavors of lemon. Let's say you want to do like a lemony mint tea, then you can put some lemongrass because it has a lemony flavor, a little bit of lemon balm. So you can add that part. And so that one, you could do a single maybe, or, you know, if you had two parts of the base, maybe that would be like a one part. So two cups of mint, let's say one part of your lemony ingredient. If you're looking to have like a minty lemony flavor, because you're coming up first, you have to think about like, what flavor am I going for? If you want it just to be for flavor, not for medicinal purpose, right? So if you do a medicinal blend, totally different story, you would, you would do it where you, what do I want to get out of this blend? And then you want to find out what herbs would coincide with like supporting those needs. And then you would create a blend. But if you're just looking to make a nice tea, then you go based on what you're looking for in flavor. Oh, and even in the medicinal blends, you could still create, you can add additional ingredients like these, you know, uh, the base ingredient, for example, or secondary ingredient just to like round out, add flavor to something that maybe not, doesn't have a lot of flavor because many of these medicinal herbs don't have a lot of flavor. Like Tulsi basil sweet. So you could add Tulsi basil 
as a secondary or a base ingredient, depending on how much you want of that and what flavor, like how much, how strong you want that flavor to, be, to consist in that blend. And then you can that make that and make, you know, or you can add it to blends to add flavor. So if you're, if you're making a blend and the blend's like, mm, something's missing, then pick a flavor that is, to bring something out or to round off the flavor, either bring a flavor out or round off a flavor that could, you can then choose the next ingredient. And then, you know, the, the last one was the accent ingredient, which I talk about in the book. And so the accent ingredient is like that finishing touch. So maybe you want to add some flowers. You could do calendula. You could do bachelor buttons. If you want some color, um, maybe you want to do a hawthorn berries or you want to do strawberry. So strawberry, you can dehydrate chop strawberries and then add dehydrated strawberries or freeze dried strawberries. If you have a freeze dryer, I don't, I'd love one. Um, and then that would give you like that accent flavor, right? Wow. Uh, the same way if you, you can create your own blends with, which is, it was cut from the book because we had to keep it at a certain length, but the, um, you, if you, let's say you had a bunch of green tea leaves and you're like, Hmm, I want to do something with this. I want to make a fruity green tea. So you could take your base ingredient, which would be your green tea. And then you can add accent ingredients to that. So lemon, uh, dried lemon rind you could do strawberries you could do dry pineapple apricot like whatever you want to bring out so you can, you can st- like instead of letting the green tea leaves go to waste let's say you're not drinking them enough or you had a ton of mint then you can add ingredients to it to bring out flavors fruity lemony spicy you could put cinnamon bark which is not in the book you know like I could have gone on and on I could have made a <laughs> double the light gonna say you need like a part two <laughs> I need a part two ginger is like lovely right but so is cinnamon bark and so is licorice root so you can add chopped parts and create like a second you know like a, a depth of flavor or an accent flavor so that's how you would blend it so based on parts it's really important that you measure accordingly so I suggest measuring what you can there's two ways to do it you can measure into a measuring cup mix it in the measuring cup and put it into the jar. But I like to measure into a jar so I know how much fits. And then I pour it out so it looks like layers in the jar of my choice. And then I pour that out into a large measuring cup. I stir it up really, really well, even break up the ingredients. If there's like flour, for example, red clover is a large ingredient, but it's really light and airy. So you can like work it with your hands a little bit to try to break up the flowers into smaller pieces so they're easier to blend. So that way, every time you have a scoop into your tea, uh, you're, you have that ingredient each time. If you leave it as a whole, unless you grab a flower, you're not going to have the red clover in your blend. So break right. it up with your hands, massage it, put some gloves on, massage it, break it up, and then use a funnel and pour it back into the jar. Label it and store it in a, you know, close a jar, put it in, a, in your cupboard and have fun <laughs> yeah so measuring go ahead oh sorry that's it <laughs> oh, okay yeah just so, so there's kind of a science to when you're a fun science not a strict science when you're kind of creating and having fun creating these blends and mixing all these flavors and things like that I mean it's so fun you can really go crazy like you could do I've done red peppercorns yeah I've so- done you know I've done um, you can do coriander seed you could because the coriander seed and cilantro if you don't like cilantro, you're not having cilantro. Cilantro and coriander seed have two different flavors, right? Coriander seed is a different flavor. So you can put coriander seed into your blend. I wouldn't put cilantro in your tea. I'd put coriander <laughs> seed. And it tastes really nice. It, it has a different kind of spice to it. And, you know, you can, once you get started, you can just think about like, hmm, what can I put in my blend? Y- you can, the sky's the limit. And I suggest yeah. trying the flavors first, you know, boiling it and seeing how it tastes before you add it. See if you like the flavor. Right. Uh, so, you know, you, you boil, I mean, everyone knows cinnamon, but you can like, so you don't have to necessarily taste that. But as you add each one, maybe like taste it. See, do I like this? How much of this do I want in my tea blend? And then you can add that accordingly. Yeah. <laughs> So Jennifer jumps in and said, or has written in, sorry, and says, hi, Matt, uh, what information today? Is this any information listed anywhere uh, besides the book online from Julia? Thank you. And thank you, Jennifer, because I realized we haven't really said, you know, where you can pick up Julia's book. So definitely juliademacos.com. Uh, we'll have that in the show notes for everybody. Uh, that is where I would definitely be picking up my copy. Uh, I think you sell it there in your shop amongst all of your other amazing vegetable growing, seed starting uh, resources. You can sign it and you'll have it shipped out. Um, yes. I know 
I picked up a copy for the tea drinker and lover in my life. Uh, so, yeah. So is there any other information? Do you have some blog posts or uh, any other tea related stuff coming out or in the works? So I, next year I will have, so I do a lot of speaking engagements and uh, tea gardening will be a new topic. So if anyone is listening and, you know, is part of a garden club or seed library or what ha- or library or what have you would like me to speak. So this will be a new topic for me for next year, in addition to the other ones. And then I will probably start and I'm going to have a workshop. So if you're local and you want to come see me, I'm going to teach, I'll have several of uh, you come and see me and we'll do like a whole workshop where I teach you how to blend the different uh, teas. Uh, you can, you'll take home tea with you in jars. You'll uh, learn how to properly brew it because there's a science to that too, which is in the book, <laughs> which we yeah. have to touch on. Oh, we're going to definitely touch on that. <laughs> um, so, but right now, no, not on the blog, but if you're on Instagram, if you go back to the summer when the book was released, I did a lot more posts then, some ideas on brewing and um, some blend ideas. So definitely check that out on my Instagram page at Julia DeMacos. Yeah, but I will have more coming up. So now that the winter is coming and I can relax a little bit, I'll definitely be writing again and I will definitely be sure to do that. But definitely check out the book. And if you order from me, then I will sign it and ship it out to you. And also it's available at Chapters, Amazon, what have you. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Uh, well, I think I might have to be uh, coming to visit you for one of those uh, I tea would seminars. Love that. Well, certainly, I'll bring uh, the copy of our book here and get that side, <laughs> if you will. I would love that. It's going to be so much fun. We'll, we'll have we'll drink tea. We'll blend some tea. You'll take home tea. You'll learn all about tea and how to brew it and blend it. It's going to be a blast. It's going to be so much fun. Awesome. So, if you're interested in that, if you're in the GTA. Um, <laughs> Mono Ontario, Google it now to get your directions uh, and definitely watch <laughs> juliademacros.com uh, for when that shows up uh, yes. on, and available. So you, you had mentioned brewing. So I think all of us kind of think, you know, you boil some water, you pour it in your little loose leaf thing or your tea bag, you pour it, you steep it and enjoy. But there's a little bit more to it, I think, isn't there with some of the different teas and, and you do touch on it in the book, but um... I do touch on it in the book and I discuss also in not just the temperature, but also the vessel that you're going to brew it in. Yeah. So, and, and I have to say like the difference, I've done a lot of research, but in doing the research, I've also been drinking and tasting and exploring and seeing with my eyes. So when you go to the, if you're going to be buying tea, I don't recommend unless you just want the flavor buying things in tea bags. So what happens is that when tea is sold loose leaf, you're having the whole leaf sold to you and the best ingredients. So it's it's not going to be the dust and the, the debris. It's going to be like the whole leaf, the whole ingredient, and then you brew that. And I'll talk about how, where to brew it, how to brew it. If you're buying a tea bag, you're buying the bits that are left over. So all the good parts were collected packaged and then all the <laughs> sediment at the bottom the dust the bits the debris that's what they put in a tea bag because it doesn't fit if you think about it you need to like it's just the bits it's not the best part so and it's cheaper so if you're gonna buy herbal tea if you're gonna buy black tea what have you ideally you want to buy it whole leaf so because all the flavors are in that. And then when you brew it, if you put it into a tea bag, I don't do that as much anymore, only if it's inconvenient otherwise. Um, I try to brew it in a way that allows the leaf to open entirely. So if you put it into a tea bag, it doesn't have room to expand. It's compacted. So you're not releasing the best flavor. So you wanna put it into either a, a little tea strainer, what are they called? Ball, even the tea ball to me is small. So unless you're putting a little bit, uh, it's not going to have space to open. So my favorite is a tea press. I bought a tea press, you know, like a coffee press could be a tea press. It's the same thing. Just don't use coffee and tea in the same, you know, they don't interchange. There's going to be like a flavor of coffee left over. They're going to be trying to brew tea. So I have two. I have a coffee press and I have a tea press. So the tea press is great. So I put my ingredients in the tea press. I cover it with water. We'll talk about the temperature in a second. That matters too. <laughs> and I, I cover it with water and I put the tea press down just a little bit, just to suspend it under the water. And I let it sit four or five minutes because herbal tea, you should brew for four or five minutes. 
depending on the ingredients. So if they are roots, you want to do a decoction, which I have in the book. I discuss a decoction is cooking it in a pot because so the, the whole point of boiling the water to absorb into the tea leaves or into the to say any ingredient is it needs to break down the cell walls. So if the ingredient is small and thin walled, it's it can it, the infusion, which is a boiling the water, putting the leaves into the water, that's an infusion. That is enough heat to express all the flavors and the aromas and the medicinal benefits. But roots, um, so ginger, turmeric, I love turmeric in my tea, you know, uh, licorice root, echinacea, chicory, root, like if you're doing roots, they're thicker walled and they're harder to break down. So if you just put it into hawthorn berries, even, even though I do them in a blend, um, they need to sit longer. So they need to, but if you, if they sit in water that was boiled and it's not still boiling, it's cooling. So it's not getting into the plant cell walls mm. enough to extract all the flavor. So you put it in a little saucepan, you boil it at a low heat and that will extract all the flavor. Cook it for five minutes, cook it for 10, 15 minutes you know, 10 minutes and until it's extracted. So it needs more heat consistently to extract. So see, this, it is a science. And the thing is, yeah. once you start doing all these things, you start tasting things, tasting the ingredients completely differently. They don't taste the same. Because they'd be a whole new world. <laughs> whole new world. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's the first thing. So where do you brew it? You know, tea bag. Uh, there's a reason why I don't like the tea bag. A tea press is great. Or there's even smaller teapots that have a mini press inside. I have those too. Those work really well. But then I also have... Um, a teapot that doesn't have a press. It's just a teapot. You can put them in a teapot. But the thing that you want to do, uh, a, the longer the tea leaves sit, or any leaves, um, herbal tea, let's say we're talking about, the longer they sit, different flavors will come out. So you're almost better off brewing, pouring out, brewing again, than brewing, brewing, brewing nonstop, and it's brewing, and it's still brewing, and you should, you know, the flavor is getting more and more bitter and changing, and not the same so the ideal flavor is the one-time brew pour it all out so i like really mini teapots i have minis just enough to for a cup you can yeah. find those you can get it go to antique stores i really love repurposing so i go to antique shops and i try to or vintage like secondhand stores what have you get mini teapot enough for a cup pour the whole thing out now you can rebrew it and you rebrew it at a higher temperature because the first time you've already extracted all the goodness you're gonna have to do a higher temperature the next time so to temperature <laughs> <laughs> So have you ever tasted green tea and it tasted bitter? Yes. You know why that is? No, no. I always, <laughs> I, it's like, what did I do wrong? Because it doesn't okay. taste like my other. So, oh my gosh. So green tea should not be brewed at a hundred degrees. So don't boil it to maximum capacity. That's Put your tea bag in there. Let it brew for hours on end, you know, like for minutes on end. It'll, so so green tea has catechins in it. Catechins are anti-cancer properties. When they are released, they release a bitter flavor. If you boil it at a lower temperature, for me, ideal is 80, 80 degrees. Okay. Once, if you boil it at 80, the catechins will not be released. And so the bitter flavor will not be released. You brew it for under a minute at 80. Then you pour the whole thing out, drink that, and you'll find it's not going to be bitter. It's going to taste like melons like fruit, like pineapple, oh. grassy. It has like a totally different, fresh, delicious flavor. No bitterness whatsoever. And the only reason why I experience bitter is because you're boiling it at 100, it's sitting for too long, and all the catechins come out and taste bitter. It's not that you're not getting the good properties. It's just that you don't need to get those catechins. Right. Unless you're looking, you like the bitter flavor. So 80. And so if you don't, if you don't have a thermometer that, sorry, if your kettle does not have a thermometer on it, like mine does, I can set the temperature. It's great. It stops at 80. It's perfect. Then what you do is either you turn it off or before it boils, or once it boils, it turns off, you give it five minutes, maybe 10, and then pour it into your cup. And then the temperature will have dropped and then try, oh. but make sure you don't leave the tea leaves in the water, pour it all out. And then you can rebrew it the next time. So let's say you experiment and you do um, a minute at 80 because it's not too hot. The next time, try a minute and a half. You can rebrew the same leaves three, four, or five times. And each time you do so, you'll get a different flavor. Cool. Yeah, because you'll just slowly extract more and more. More and more. It'll be different levels, different layers of flavor. You can taste it. You might taste caramel. You might taste, I don't know, like... Uh, 
popcorn. I mean, they're all, all these different teas based on how they were processed when they were harvested and where they grew, they have a different flavor. So once you really get into it, which I did, then you can start <laughs> trying out different teas, you know, the same green tea, but maybe you want to try it from different parts of China. If you go to a tea shop, a proper tea shop, you can taste all these things and find which ones you like. And each time you taste it, you'd be like, wow, I taste this, I taste that. It's almost like wine tasting, but it's tea tasting. But it's, it's really tasting. cool. It's really oh. cool. So yeah, I remember before the show, we talked about how I went to this like fancy pants tea room yeah. for my daughter's birthday in the summer. And I was like, you know, after writing the book, um, now I know the proper way to brew tea. So I didn't get green because I knew there's no way they're going to brew it at 80. There's just no way. <laughs> they're going to boil the water to maximum 100, <laughs> fill a beautiful, you know, porcelain teapot bone china teapot with like all the leaves probably too much because you don't need that much the measurements are in the book you need a teaspoon you don't need like tablespoons full <laughs> i would have put in like yeah like a full tablespoon or a bit more too much yep yeah, too much and then of course they're not going to give me a strainer so it's going to sit there and cook and cook and cook so anyways, i got a black tea and the first cup tasted amazing but i you know i knew they boiled it i don't boil my black tea to 100 either i boil it to like 90 95 there's a difference and then I pour the whole thing out <laughs> or take your tea bag out don't leave right. it there and um anyways so the first cup was yummy the second cup was still yummy and by the third it was just bitter it was so bitter all the catechins oh. came out and I was just like oh I ruined it so <laughs> <laughs> so that's really key is, is knowing the temperature knowing the temperature a few degrees like one way or the other and the yeah. whole thing is different it's a whole different experience and flavor profile like it's amazing out. and I, yeah i have to say people say to me you know chamomile when i grow it it tastes so bitter you know it does taste bitter don't boil it to 100 boil it to 90 and take it out leave it for a minute and then take it out and the longer the chamomile sits in hotter water the more bitter it will taste so take it out wow. brew it at a lower temperature Pam has written uh capitals o m g triple exclamation point <laughs> <laughs> who would have known that julia thank you so much and like for I love it. <laughs> mark. wow there's so much who would have thought right just growing yeah. some plants creating some teas it's just, just you know what it's so great because you know it's easy to grow herbs for tea yeah. they're they don't have pests pests are not attracted to them they have essential oils in them that the pests don't want so it's like they have their own you know repellent already built in so they're so easy to grow. You control what the, the ground you're growing them in. You control whether you're spraying them or not. They produce a ton. And then you have self-sufficiency in harvesting them yourself, drying them the way you like, keeping them stored the way you like, and then brewing your own. Like you don't have to buy tea. You can just, you know, to say you can make, you can grow your own or you can buy, you know, really good ingredients from herb companies, you know, in bulk and uh, make your own that way. Yeah, I was going to say, if you actually go for, like, the true camellia teas, like, you could buy that just as a nice quality base. And yes. then do some stuff. Yes. Exactly. Oh. Time is flying by. We have <laughs> maybe five minutes left. Um, <laughs> one, I'm wondering, um, what was your, have you discovered a new favorite tea for yourself? Or do you have a favorite tea? Well, I really love green tea now that I know how to brew it properly I like I right. really love it and I love matcha so I learned how to properly do matcha because matcha is a powder and you have to it's completely different it's not in the book I didn't don't think I mentioned matcha because you know you have a limit right it's tea garden, gardening for beginners not for like seasoned experts so yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so there's only so much I can include and um I really like green tea a lot if it's brewed correctly and I do love I love um lemongrass and i grow my own so i never have to buy it and it is so delicious is a tea so that's one of my favorites yeah and i love of course ginger i mean don't get me started it's really hard <laughs> but tulsi basil tulsi basil and catnip are fantastic and red clover in a blend and dandelion flowers and i mean just like anyway <laughs> i love it so speaking of growing you have something coming up you were mentioning a new product, um, yes. a new offering through the website. So, yes. So on my website, I'm just working out the details. 
finalizing the last thing, but I, you'll find on my in my shop for Christmas, I will have like uh, gift packages available for sale. My book signed, plus um, worm manure from my favorite um, worm castings company, Jocelyn Swell Booster. That bundled with the book, and I'm um, between five and ten seed packets of different plants that are featured in my book. So you can grow your own tea with but using the worm castings, which is the best. They're the best. And using the information in my book, you can create your own little mini herb garden for tea. So what a perfect that'll Christmas be, gift. Yeah, that'll be in my shop. I'm just finalizing the final details um, and that'll be listed soon. So keep your eyes open for that. Keep an eye open on juliademarcos.com for that, <laughs> as well as any of the seeds. If you've been excited about the different plants um, that Julie has been uh, growing and testing and playing with in her own garden, I know you package, uh, save, and store and sell a lot of those seeds as well. Um, I do. So, yeah, so take a look there. Keep an eye out for those as well. Yeah. Did you want to quickly talk about anything yeah, else? Yeah, so, so um, on my... Yeah, so in my shop right now, I still have seeds from last year, but they're all, they had like 100%, 99% viability rate. So all kinds of tomatoes and other things, and they're all on clearance now. So if you're looking to stock up on tomatoes, lettuce, they're $2 each right now. So definitely get them and they'll be in there until I, my, my new 2023 seeds are going to be coming out. So I haven't finished processing them yet, but once I do, then I'll take out all the old seeds and have all the new seeds available. So if you're looking to stock up, Go there now and uh, I will ship them to you within Canada and anywhere in Canada. So please take a look. And so I also have my seed starting calculator, which is um, really popular. I use it myself and I developed it so to help people know exactly when to plant what from A to Z, vegetables, herbs, flowers, everything's included to the final date of sowing or starting indoors, you know, to transplant out. Everything covers for the whole year. So definitely check that out. It is a beautiful calculator. I love it. I, yeah, I've been, I have a folder that is just juliademacos.com and it's all in. <laughs> I so appreciate it. <laughs> so you have to go, you've got to go check out her stuff. Don't forget to check out uh, your ebook as well. Um, yes. How to plant a vegetable garden. So if you're looking to start, you're going to start a tea garden and you need some great tips. So really check out uh, your new ebook, how to plan a vegetable garden Thank as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's everything's in my shop. So juliedemacos.com slash shop. Slash shop. And I will make yeah. sure that though that gets into the show notes as well. Uh, so okay. as we say show notes, if you Google down the garden path, uh, Julia Demacos or just the podcast for all the past episodes, you can go in and find the show notes and all the links and everything that we describe. So look for tonight's show and you can find all the links uh, or straight back to Julia. Yeah. So well, Thank you for having me. This was so much fun. I, you know, I loved co-hosting with you, by the way. That was so much fun. Yes. Thank <laughs> you so much for joining me here. While Joanne is out having a cruise, we're having fun talking all about Tea Garden. It was a wonderful time. T truly my pleasure to have you as a co-host and uh, well done. Thank you. <laughs> you were awesome. Co-host any time with you. <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> We'll have you back. We'll just kick Joanne off and we'll just Aww, no. maybe she'll get jealous and have to kick me off so you two can <laughs> have a fun show together too. <laughs> so thank you everybody for tuning in this evening. Uh, you are listening to Down the Garden Path podcast here on Reality Radio 101. And we look forward to talking with you all next week. Uh, same time, same channel. Until then, enjoy your week and thank you very much for tuning in. Take care, everyone. Thank you for listening to Down the Garden Path with your host, Joanne Shaw, and Matthew Dressing right here on Reality Radio 101.